Welcome back to Module 2, and this is the last lecture video for Chapter 4. Now, the slides for this particular section on eclipses, uh, I've got about 20 slides, but the key content can be summarized in about two, and then we spend the rest of the time seeing some pretty cool images and diagrams that will help us understand how eclipses happen and recognize without just memorizing, recognize why there are certain requirements for them. So we start out with a reminder that when we discussed phases of the moon, we talked about how there's this common misconception that the Earth's shadow is what causes our monthly um, phases of the moon. Now, there certainly is an astronomical event that includes the Earth's shadow, and once we have learned about it, it may be more, e more easily distinguishable in our minds what is a phases of the moon situation and what is a um, Earth's shadow uh, situation. Okay, so that's our topic. Now, there are two types of eclipses, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, and there are kind of subtypes within those, but inherently we just need to recognize that the reason eclipses can happen but are rare is because of these two points on this slide. First of all, the reason why it tends to be in our mind that the Earth's shadow is so important is because all the diagrams we ever see are on flat paper. And so it seems like for a full moon, the Earth should always be getting in the way of the moon. But these things are not perfectly aligned in three-dimensional space. But because we are stuck with flat paper, we don't have cool holographic paper widespread use yet, we lose the third dimension, and so we get this misconception built into our heads over time. The other thing that causes these kinds of misconceptions is that these um, ideas are not accurate to scale models. The sun is about 400 times farther away than the moon, and it is also about 400 times bigger across. That is pure coincidence, and it's one of the things that allows us to have total solar eclipses when that is a relatively rare phenomenon to have them both look so similar sized in our minds. If we were to put together a um, alien tour guide, a tourist guide to the Earth, total solar eclipses might be one of the things that we highlight as a really cool thing that we happen to have by pure coincidence. So that first statement, that this isn't perfect alignment, it is worth recognizing that when we think about the celestial sphere model from module one, we use that model to help us think about how things appear to move through our sky because we're stuck here on Earth. This diagram here is showing the moon's path through our celestial sphere model and the sun's path through our celestial sphere model. Now, the sun's path is called the ecliptic. We learned that term back in module one. The moon's path doesn't have its own special name because it is almost along the ecliptic. It is offset by about five degrees, which means if we look at where the sun always is and where the moon always is, there are two points where those paths cross each other. These are called nodes. Now, because of the way all of this works, where the moon is going around every month, but the changes to the sun's position in the celestial sphere is because our orbit every single um, year, those nodes don't line up on the same calendar date all the time, but there is a time frame where eclipses can happen, and it's around those nodes, and so you might hear the phrase eclipse season if you do any digging into articles about solar eclipses or you look further into the textbook. Eclipse season is just a uh, way of describing the fact that it is not all the time that the sun and the moon are able to be in the same spot. It has to be at those special nodes. The other thing that we want to um, think about, this size difference or the scale, comes down to this idea of angular size. 
Now, if you have ever heard the term supermoon, that is where the moon is slightly closer to the Earth in its orbit, and so it looks a little bit bigger in our sky. On the diagram here, um, that closest point is called perigee, and that's the size of the moon as seen from Earth. And then there is a micro moon, but that tends to be less exciting, and so newspapers don't write about it. And that's when the moon is farthest away um, from the Earth in its not quite circular orbit, and that's apogee. We don't need those terms, but it is worth recognizing that the moon is not physically changing size. The moon is the moon. But as it gets closer to us and farther away from us, it changes how big it actually looks, right? That's angular size that we're talking about there. So the reason why total solar eclipses can happen is because the range of sizes that the sun can appear is extremely similar to the range of sizes that the moon can appear in terms of angular size, about half a degree. Now the size of the sun in our sky changes because the Earth's orbit is not quite circular, but it's close, so the difference is small. And so the image here is showing in the upper left quadrant, the smallest sun, the upper right quadrant, the smallest moon. And if we think about that, the moon wouldn't actually be able to cover up the sun, and we'll talk about what happens then. But if we look at the bottom, even the largest sun, bottom left corner, compared to the largest moon, bottom right corner, the moon can fully cover up the sun. And so a lot of the time, we actually get this special case where the moon is able to completely cover up the sun, and that is when we get a solar eclipse. Okay. Now, no matter what light source and what object blocking that light source we're talking about, I do want us to make sure that we're on the same page about how shadows work. Because we're going to see these terms penumbra and umbra, and I want to make sure we understand what that's trying to describe. So if we had a little spaceship, I'm going to use my um, cursor, my mouse cursor as a spaceship. So we could fly around, and if we're here, for example, we can see the sun and we can see the moon as we're flying around in our spaceship. As we start to get behind this object, I call it the moon, but it could be any object. As we start to get behind it in this region that is, um, that is kind of not quite lined up, we would be able to see part of the sun, but part of it would be blocked. So if we moved to exactly location two here, most of the sun would be blocked from our view by this blue object. And that's shown at the bottom of the page here. If we flew so that we were lined up a little bit better, so in location one, now that blue object has completely covered up our view of the sun, and we would get a total eclipse. When that happens, we are in the full shadow, and that term for the full shadow is umbra. If we flew back out again, near the edge of the partial shadow, we would get some of the sun covered up, but not a lot of it. That would be location three at the bottom of our slide. And when we're in that partial shadow, we're, we're in what's called the penumbra. And then last in our spaceship, if we were to fly so that we're lined up again, but now we're too far away, now we're at that micro moon situation where it can't fully cover up the sun, even though it's lined up, we still see the sun all the way around the outside, we will give that a specific name. That type of solar eclipse is called an annular eclipse. We'll see it again in our slides in just a bit. And that's when we have not been able to fully cover up the sun, and so we're still not in that perfect umbra cone of really dark shadow. Okay, so when we are talking about a solar eclipse, the easy way to think about a solar eclipse is it happens during the daytime. The sun was visible and then all of a sudden it isn't. This is because the moon's shadow is falling on a portion of the earth. The moon has a relatively small shadow and so it's only going to cast that shadow on a portion of the earth. But if you're in that path, you're gonna see something really, really neat. 
So, for example, on August 21st in 2017, there was a total solar eclipse that was um, referred to as the Great American Eclipse because it went from Oregon down to South Carolina and almost every location on the continental United States could see a fairly large partial eclipse. And then if you were in the path of totality, you would be able to see a total eclipse. I was extremely lucky. I have um, relatives that live in Tennessee and they actually live in the path of totality. So we just hung out in their front lawn. We had a kind of a family reunion. A lot of people came by and we looked at um, the solar eclipse, the total solar eclipse. So I took these photos um, on a kind of small point and click camera, not my cell phone. And I did have to have a filter. Uh, so in the previous image, I was wearing special solar glasses, never looked directly at the sun without proper um, equipment. And for the camera too, I had to have a filter so that it wasn't overwhelmed by brightness. But this set of images is showing the moon coming into view and we're basically getting into that lined up situation. In Grand Rapids, you weren't quite in the path of totality, and so you would have gotten pretty much this amount of eclipse, and then that would have been it. But in the path of totality, we got to see something really impressive. At the point of totality, the sun's corona, or outer atmosphere, becomes visible to the naked eye. These two images were taken without any kind of filter whatsoever. I haven't done anything with Photoshop to enhance them either. I'm not that good with Photoshop. And during this portion, a couple of minutes of time, you could take off the special glasses and just look at the um, sky. And the sky looked relatively dark. It was kind of dusk. Um, and the sun looked really creepy because it was this kind of glow all around the moon that was covering up the sun. So these two photographs are showing on the left, kind of right in the middle of that totality, and on the right is this diamond ring effect where the um, moon is just about to leave totality and we start to get the shine of the regular sun, and that's when it no longer becomes safe to look directly at. Now, if you missed this event entirely, or if you weren't able to travel to the, um, to the path of totality, you're in luck because in 2024, the not too distant future, there is another great American eclipse where you don't have to travel the world to um, these distant locations to be in the path of totality. Unfortunately, Michigan itself doesn't get into the path, but if we travel to Indiana or Detroit, uh, not Detroit, sorry, if we... Unfortunately, Michigan is not in the path of totality, but if we drive down to Indiana or Ohio, it is not too difficult to get into that path of totality. You don't have to fly somewhere um, fancy to, to see it. And I really recommend if you are able to, to try to do so, because there's nothing that I could say to describe what it actually feels like to see it in person. Um, it's just very kind of life-changing, very cool. Now for a solar eclipse, um, these happen at most twice a year during these eclipse seasons. And when they happen, somewhere on Earth is going to get the, the path, and hopefully it's a total solar eclipse, but in the next slide we'll talk about an annular solar eclipse. But it is possible to see a partial solar eclipse if you're farther away from that path. So um, this set of images shows the way a partial solar eclipse works is you never get fully lined up, you get close. Um, and so this is an example from 2015 where the best, most covered up is right in the middle here and even then it isn't fully covered up. One thing to note though is when you are viewing a partial eclipse, if you don't have fancy glasses, you can take advantage of um, pinhole cameras. So you may have used a pinhole camera, which was one um, 
poked out point in a paper or um, paper plate and projected an image. But you can get more creative. On the left, um, I was holding a, a colander, a sieve, with a whole bunch of um, holes over a paper plate. And we basically have a whole bunch of the partial eclipse on that paper plate. On the right, this is an image of a um, of sunlight filtering through the trees during a partial eclipse. And you can actually see if you pay attention that every single point of light hitting the sidewalk there is a little um, crescent shape because what we are filtering is actually an image of the partial eclipse happening. Kind of cool. And so again, if the moon is not big enough to cover up the sun. I've mentioned the term before, but now it is physically typed out on our slides. There is an annular solar eclipse that occurs if the moon is too small or the Earth, I suppose, is too big. So this particular set of images is from um, 2012. Every, every year we have zero, one, or two solar eclipses. And sometimes they are annular like this, and sometimes they are total. So to summarize, so this slide is the full entire summary of solar eclipses. There are these terms to describe the different types, total, annular, and partial. And the required conditions, we have to be in eclipse season. So this can't happen any single time of the year the nodes have to be in the right spot, and the moon has to be in the right place when the nodes are in the right spot. To see it, you do have to be in a portion of the Earth where you're in that narrow path of totality or close enough to that path of totality. And extremely important, if we don't understand why this is true, then it's probably worth going back to the start of this section or drawing it out, the moon has to be in the new moon phase to have a solar eclipse. If the moon is going to get in the way of the sun, it has to be already the normal moon that is closest to the sun, which is new moon from our prior lecture videos. Okay, lunar eclipses. The same kind of thing, there are three different types that we can talk about. Penumbral eclipses are kind of the analog to annular solar eclipses. They're the ones that were almost the right conditions for total, but not quite. But the difference here is for a penumbral lunar eclipse, it's because the eclipse is happening not quite at the eclipse season, where it's not right on the node, but near it. If the moon only goes through the penumbra, the partial dark shadow, it is actually really hard to tell it's happening. And so it's not that exciting to non-astronomers. We're not going to spend time thinking about the penumbral eclipses. You're welcome to look them up more if you're interested. But partial lunar eclipses and total lunar eclipses can happen when the moon is able to go through part of um, that extra dark shadow or all of that extra dark shadow. So in the situation here, for example, the um, moon, as it goes near the node um, of the location, so this yellow moon here would be if everything was absolutely perfect, it would be the best total lunar eclipse. The red and green here are the farthest that you can get while still having a total lunar eclipse. And if the moon is anywhere between this red and pink, or anywhere between this green and teal, then you get a partial lunar eclipse. And then the pink itself and um, green, teal itself would be that penumbral eclipse, and so on. You don't have to memorize this if it's not, um, if it's not a useful diagram for you, it's not a big deal. But it is showing us how these different types really only um, change because of where the moon hits the Earth's shadow. So, when the moon is going through Earth's shadow, it means that the sun is on one side of our sky and the moon is on the opposite. So we are talking about a full moon phase. 
when we have the full moon phase, as it goes through the Earth's shadow, so on the left we have a composite of several different time steps over the course of a couple of hours. When it goes through Earth's shadow, we get shapes that do not match our normal phase shapes. One thing that really is a big factor in students holding on to the misconception about Earth's shadow is if you are drawing the middle image here for a gibbous moon instead of the actual gibbous moon on the far right side. So it is really important that you pay attention to the actual shape of the moon during regular phases, especially during gibbous phase, because it is actively different than what the Earth's shadow is able to do. So this um, animation shows a time lapse of going through a lunar eclipse where the really bright moon is what it would have looked like during that full moon that day and it is going through part of the circular shadow of the Earth. It is worth noting that total lunar eclipses are slightly more common than total solar eclipses because there's no chance that the Earth's shadow is too small as um, it is for annular solar eclipses where the moon's shadow is too small. And so this is the big summary slide for lunar eclipses. You have to be in eclipse season still. To see it, you actually only need to be on the nighttime side. So half of Earth's inhabitants can see a lunar eclipse when it happens. It may be happening as sunset is occurring or as sunrise is occurring, but the easiest way to see this is if it's actually happening in the middle of the night. And then the moon has to be in the full moon phase for it to be able to occur. And hopefully, again, that's something that it's not about memorizing it for the sake of memorizing it, but recognizing why that has to be true in order to have a lunar eclipse occur. So there's a short two-minute video that does a really good job summarizing um, this idea of the misalignment in a way that I can't really do with um, single two-dimensional slides. Uh, and I really like this, um, this tweet by Katie Mack from Twitter using simple emoji to show that a lunar eclipse happens when the sun and moon are on opposite sides, full moon. A solar eclipse happens when the sun and the um, moon are on the same side of the earth, solar eclipse. And I love it, the moon and the um, earth are close enough together that if the sun were somehow in between them, it truly would be an apocalypse. So uh, this is the end of module two, besides this short two-minute video, um, and so I will see you in the next module.